London from over the pole, flying in a big airliner. In the late 1960s, the Woodstock generation thought it could change the world through its music and its philosophy of peace and love. But as that dream started to fade, new musicians emerged to challenge that optimism, sometimes aggressively. Using the rock stage almost as a theater, they acted out the fantasies and insecurities of themselves and their audiences in a more uncertain age. of choice in the New York inner circles in the late 60s was amphetamine. Acid had a hard time catching on because New York is not the prettiest place in the world. You want to do acid someplace where it's pretty and you can talk to God and see trees and, you know, flowers and go back to the organic uh, beginnings of things. Standing on the corner Suitcase in my In the mid-60s, a young songwriter, fascinated by the tough street culture of New York City, joined a group of avant-garde musicians who would push rock and roll in new directions. He was born Louis Furbank in 1942. I had a real problem with authority, always have. I had a real problem with being able to hold a job, a normal job. I only had, I think, three in my life. Some lasted a half hour and some half a day. I'd often thought, like, what are you going to do <laughs> for a job? You can't do anything. And I fell into the band thing. We're sponsoring a new band. It's called The Velvet Underground. And he wanted to disturb people and shake it up. So did we. And we have this chance to combine music and, and art and uh, uh, films all together. <laughs> When the Velvet Underground started in 1966, they were considered a stunt group formed by Andy Warhol for publicity. Although they would sell only a handful of records during their short time together, the band would inspire a whole new movement in rock and roll, both with their attitude and their sound. Down he sins, of street life fancies. What I was really trying to do was to try and get a full spectre sound by taking the harmonic basis, the real bare bones of the song, and finding out whether, whether one chord would work throughout the whole song. And when it finally paid off, when we had one rehearsal there on Ludlow Street, and it was very exciting because we knew that there was something that set us apart from everybody else. Because this song that we'd worked on, Venus in Furs, had gone through a number of folk rock variations, and all of a sudden it was in the grip of this kind of orchestral and sinuous noise that we had going. It's very sexy. I love, I love Raymond Chandler. That blonde was as pleasant as a split lip. His manicure made his thumb look like a glistening ice cube. And it's, it's those incredible images in this in very, very simple language. And I thought a rock and roll song that contained that kind of language would be just fantastic. When I put a spike into my vein at the time, people thought we were being very negative and bleak and dark and anti, whereas, as the lyricist, I thought we were an accurate reflection of segments of New York that you can't ignore and things that were happening and were going to happen on a larger scale. $6 in my hand. 
That's waiting for my man. Everybody's doing that throughout the song. That's, I think, what I like so much about the song. It's like a train. It just starts and off it goes. I'm waiting for my man. Released in the same year as Sgt. Pepper, the Velvet Underground album was almost universally ignored. What attracted more notice was the exploding plastic inevitable, the stage show that accompanied their live performances, an assault on the audience of dancers acting out sadomasochistic fantasies to accompanying strobe lights. You killed your European son. You spit on those under 21. In May 1966, the band decided to take the show to the heart of the enemy. When we first came to California, I had never been here before, of course. Andy had. And his analogy was, oh, it's so plastic. He loved it. He loved California. You want to make love to the sea. Your European son is gone. You better say so long. The audience was fine, but the critics and the club owners, the music people, didn't like us at all. So this is this terrible, terrible influence of the virus and disease of New York City into the beautiful new counterculture of the West Coast. I, th I think generally that we just felt uh, happy in being ostracized by both the West Coast and by the Woodstock generation. We, at the end of the show, if I could call it a show, we got into feedback. And we were all leaning guitars and everything against everything, against the amps, and it made this wall of feedback. And we left the stage. The Velvets were considered too extreme at the time ever to achieve commercial success. And one by one, the members of the band went separate ways. However, a young film student had seen them in San Francisco and was inspired to start writing songs himself back in Los Angeles with his band, The Doors. I'm a spy in the house of love. I know the dream that you're dreaming of. Although Jim Morrison lived in the heart of Los Angeles, in the hippie community of Laurel Canyon, he was never really part of the love generation. Unlike the Velvet Underground, the Doors would become very successful as they explored similar themes of confrontation and sexuality. Name? Robbie Krieger. Name? John Densmore. Name? Raymond Daniel Manzer. Name? Uh, Jim. Occupation. Um, for Break On Through, their first single released in 1967, the Doors used their filmmaking skills to shoot their own promotional movie. the campus at UCLA. This is where I first met Jim Morrison. We were film students in 62 to 64. The idea of making a film is a dramatic structure, and I think the fact that Jim went to the film school, I went to the film school at UCLA, carried over into our music. It gave us a sense of drama. Come on, turn the lights on. Turn them way down. The end, obviously, is a song that uh, that works through a great deal of, uh, of uh, dramatic uh, peaks and valleys, if you will. It starts uh, starts off very softly, and it's it's basically it become it's a love song at the beginning. This is the end. It's a goodbye song. It's Jim singing goodbye to a girl. 